Okay, we're recording. Okay, I'd like to call the uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee of the Town Council for meeting for March 14, 2024 to order. It is five minutes after 10 in the morning. And uh, we have a quorum of the committee present. This meeting is being conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no person in attendance or members of the public be permitted, uh, will be permitted, but uh, we have made every effort to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in the meeting via technological means. Um, let me check with the members of the committee to make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. Um, Bob Hegner? Yes, present. Uh, Jennifer Taub? Present. Uh, Councillor Ryan? I'm present. I'm here, and uh, at this point, we have four members of five, and that is a quorum. So um, we are going to uh, proceed. I do need to advise everybody that this meeting is being recorded. And uh, it is available. Uh, it is being recorded both uh, audio and uh, for visual, so that people are aware of that. Um, so that being said, um, we um, try to begin our meetings with public comment, and we do have members of the public who are present. Um, we invite public comment, welcome public comment, because it's a very important part of what we do. Um, it does not have to be about any item on the agenda. We do ask that it be related to matters that are within the purview of the uh, committee that you're before, but uh, it does not have to be an item on the agenda. And I see that there are two, three people who have... Uh, asked to be recognized, and I'm going to take it in the order that the hands went up and ask that um, you come in and um, try and limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and, um, but, uh, you know, please give us a sense of what it is that brings you to us. And uh, so Darcy could move Darcy in. Hi, Darcy. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Darcy Dumont. I live in District 3. I'm speaking on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst, and I hope you're all doing well on this gorgeous spring day. I'm, uh, I'm attending today because there was a promise to bring a report on the waste hauler RFIs to this particular meeting. Um, they, the RFI, um, responses were received in October and now it's been five months. So um, definitely was expecting something today, but it doesn't appear to be on the agenda. So I hope it shows up in some way or another. Um, in the last session, a hauler update was on each agenda. Um, and it's uh, been a year and a half that the referral has been in TSO a little bit over a year and a half. So, um, I would hope that uh, an update could be on each agenda so that we can really work toward a recommendation back to the council as soon as possible. Just a reminder to this committee that the following organizations endorsed the initial hauler proposal to move to a town contracted service that would include pay as you throw fee structure and universal curbside compost pickup. The Amherst Board of Health, which has weighed in about three times uh, to try to push the council to move forward with this. The Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, the Amherst League of Women Voters, the Amherst Common Share Food Co-op, Climate Action Now, UMass Student Farming, Sunrise Amherst, Hitchcock Center for the Environment, the Progressive Coalition of Amherst, Grow Food Amherst, Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, Green Sanctuary Committee, Zero Waste Central Valley, uh, and statewide organizations, the Sierra Club, Massachusetts chapter, and, and Community Action Works. Um, also, Zero Waste Amherst was asked by the town to conduct a survey to ascertain the cost, 
which it did in 2023, and reported that the average user of USA hauling and recycling currently pays around $550 a year, and that the difference between small, medium, and large carts is $2 a month, definitely not enough to incentivize waste reduction. Um, Amherst, Zero Waste Amherst also reached out to find volunteers who could get the word out to educate neighbors about curbside compost pickup um, were it to be enacted by the council and have so far signed up 80 people who were to start doing outreach last summer, we had hoped. Um, waste reduction is of great interest to a very large portion of the town and residents wanna help take responsibility while also reducing their costs. So on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst, please, please, please send this back to the council with a positive recommendation on behalf of your constituents. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Darcy, appreciate it. Um, Tina, we do have, I believe, uh, on the schedule a date for the, uh, report to come back from not hearing uh, I had I'm, to... I'm just checking our planning okay. document um I think we have yes we have waste hauler RFI update on the 28th of March on the schedule at the moment um but I, I don't want to get into comments um back and forth between that, the public comment and the members. So we should continue that, with public that's comment. The only, it's only information. Okay, thanks. We don't, we don't have discussion of uh, items that come in, but we will provide information at times. Uh, so the 28th is the answer on when we have it back on the agenda, which is our next meeting. Uh, Tracy, morning. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, so I'm here just to comment briefly about the um, the North Pleasant Street improvements from Eastman Lane to Pine Street, Meadow Street. Uh, so I did, I, I also just want to introduce myself to uh, Councillor Hegner. I think I know everybody else here, but I do serve as the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. And, um, and I noticed it made its way into your packet uh, but I had written up a memo from when TAC was asked to um, advise the TSO way back when. I think uh, Council Ryan actually sent that request to TAC with a proposed schedule of when it would be reviewed by TSO and then everything got bumped back because there wasn't any funding and there were other priorities. Um, but just because you know there have been more and more discussions and potential projects about um, individual improvements along the section. And so we just wanted to get it on the record about what TAC had discussed then, what we reviewed, what we thought. Um, so just overall, um, you know, this project improving this corridor is has been a, a priority that TAC has um, listed in terms of um, recommended town projects for a number of years. Um, we've reviewed a number of different iterations of the project and project maps that have come to us from the DTPW. Uh, Guilford Moore, the DPW superintendent, is the TAC liaison for the staff. Um, so it's been, you know, it's identified as a priority route for bikes and pedestrians in the Amherst Bicycle and Pedestrian Network Plan. And um, and again, and back in 2021, we did review it. Um, we did two different site visits and uh and so on so we do we definitely support the, it in general we haven't looked at all the details of some of the different projects my understanding from talking to mr Moring is that um what is proposed currently this next phase is pretty much what we reviewed um we do appreciate i mean anything that could be done to improve the safety and accessibility along the corridor is great uh, it is a very high use pedestrian corridor since it's right north of the university and additionally even since we did our review back in 2021 there have there has been additional housing built there um, both the mill district housing but then also the new development that replaced north village when we did our review that property was closed um, so adding more crosswalks is a great idea 
when we visited, we did see students, you know, just getting off the bus, particularly, and just going across the streets. And currently, there are some sections with very few crosswalks. Um, and we appreciate other measures, too, to um, the calm the traffic there. So, I mean, some sections of that road are 35 miles an hour, um, which I really think that's probably too fast for a corridor that has so many pedestrians. But it's not really sufficient just to change the speed limit. Like you actually need to design, do other improvements um, to calm the traffic. And so even though I know there's talk about adding the crosswalks with the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, but even there, I would just be cautious that even though they can be effective, that alone might not um, keep all the pedestrians safe. Like for example, I was recently downtown um, and I was, I had hit the buttons across at a rectangular rapid flashing crosswalk mm -hmm. and I was in the middle of crossing and a vehicle did not stop at all and like came very, very close to my body. Um, so, uh, and particularly because with the number of students there, this is a highly used corridor at night. Um, and so, you know, the research shows that that alone is not sufficient, that you also want to have lighting. So I did recently revisit the corridor. Um, and there are quite a few street lights on the west side of the street. But when we when we were there back in 2021 and when I was there again recently, our concerns had been about the east side of the street, which is when you're on the university campus section of it, just north of the roundabout, it's very well lit. But as you continue, it seems sort of dark. That's also the section of the sidewalk that's overgrown a lot, um, you know, there's a lot of trees and so on. So I don't even know, maybe even just cutting back some of the vegetation would help with that, but it's not that well lit, you know, for nighttime use. Um, and so one of the things I had mentioned in the memo is just the idea of the streetscape lighting. And um, I think that was my main comments. I mean, I will also just say, uh, not specifically related to this, but I do like to try to go to the TSO meetings, but with the change of the schedule, like they used to be in the evenings and now they're during the day. And um, I do have like two standing work meetings back to back in this time slot, one at 10 and one at 11. So I'm actually going to depart and then I'll just listen to your recording. But um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I wanted to uh, thank you and the committee for the report. I thought that it was extremely helpful. And I so thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Chow. Hi. Hi, my name is Jennifer Shaw. I live in District 5, and I'm a member of the Amherst School Committee, but my comment today is my own and does not represent the school committee. One of the items on your agenda today is the town manager's appointment to the Elementary School Building Committee. The charge of the Elementary School Building Committee indicates that it needs to include a resident with experience in energy-efficient public architecture, engineering, or construction, which you have an architect, Jonathan Salvan, a teacher or resident with knowledge of current educational mission and function of current facilities, which you have in Jonathan and resident member Angelica Bernal, and a resident with experience in effective community outreach, a position I don't see filled amongst the current members, and a function I don't see mentioned in the town manager's recommendation memo for, for Mr. Bruce Coldham. As a side note, I don't know Mr. Coldham, but I mean him no disrespect. I understand from the memo that he has followed this project closely from the beginning, and I thank him for his interest and involvement in this very important project. But getting back to the committee charge, it also says that preference will be given to parents and guardians of young children who may be in the elementary schools in five years. This charge was adopted in June of 2020, so five years from then would be 2025. Another applicant for the position, Amber Cano Martin, has a child in second grade in the Caminantes program, and she is a skilled, experienced, and accomplished community organizer. In addition, she herself is bilingual in English and Spanish. The ESBC does not need two resident architects at the expense of a parent of a child who will attend school in this new building and who has both deep and broad experience connecting with the community, particularly with families of school-aged children. This project is so important to the school community and I urge you to prioritize community engagement. Also, please keep in mind that the member who vacated this position is a woman of color with school-aged children. If that position is not filled by a resident with young children, then you would be reducing the voice of parents on this committee when the charter specifically says that preference will be given to parents of young children. 
I contacted Ms. Connell Martin this week to ask if I could name her in my public comment today, and she did give me permission. But without my being here and doing this, the TSO and, and the town council would not know that she had applied. The town manager's memo recommending Mr. Coldham sounds very professional and convincing, and with nothing and no one to compare it to, it sounds like a solid decision. But it's important that you know what you would be giving up by approving this appointment as recommended. I'm urging you to vote no on this appointment and send the town manager back to follow the committee charge and appoint a parent with community outreach experience. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So, um, see nobody else who's coming for public comment. Uh, and, uh, but uh, what has been offered will be um, before the committee when we reach the agenda items. And uh, so we should uh, get on to the next topics on the agenda. And uh, we have, uh, I think several people from Amherst College who are here for item four and we have item three, which is the North Pleasant Street pedestrian improvements. And uh, we have Guilford Mooring who is here from DPW um, to help with the presentation and answer questions about North Pleasant. We had also asked, um, raised the question of whether uh, the Jason or Guilford would have any comments about the sign uh, that's proposed for uh, Amherst College and whether uh, there were any concerns that DPW had from uh, the, the, the requested placement of the sign and whether it would affect traffic um, or visibility. Um, so I don't know, if Guilford, if you have anything that you can say on that subject. Uh, do you want do you want to start with the sign, Amherst sign first, or do you want to start with North Pleasant Street first? Um, I know we have several people from Amherst College and I um, who are in the uh, attendee list and. Uh, we, if we decide that we want to bring them in, uh, maybe it would make sense to just uh, have that conversation, that discussion first. If, is that agreeable to the committee? If anybody objects, otherwise, I think we'll just go with, we'll do that first. No one's raised their hand to say that they have a problem. Is there anything that uh, EPW has to comment on? Uh, we've worked with the college on this sign. They've kind of proposed this and we've talked to them about how to do it. They've also worked with the state DOT to get some of the work in the sidewalk and some of the other things done before the sign was installed. So the college has been, uh, the college in the town, our DPW has talked quite a bit about this. Um, we think that the way it's laid out is fine with the public way. There's not an issue we see. There's no issues with site distances or anything like that. Um, so we're completely on board with that, what they propose. Um, we don't do the uh, aesthetic thing. Uh, so that is for someone else to comment on. Paul? You may have already said this, but there are two representatives from Amherst College in the audience if you are interested in talking to them directly. Yes. Um... Do we want to bring them in? Is, uh, is that agreeable to the committee? I think getting nodded his head. So, and bring, uh, is it, uh, I know Sarah is one. I believe Seth. Yeah. And Seth, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Morning. So I'm just, I was actually in another meeting scheduled at the same time. So I was waiting until it came up on the agenda, but I'm here. I'm sorry, did, did we mess you up by uh, recognizing you in the audience? <laughs> no, no, I I had two Zooms going on at the same time, I had, I, which was, I had one on my phone and one on my computer. So I could try Good to morning, pay attention. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Paula, that was just what you were. George, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just thought we'd try to focus this a bit. I have absolutely no objections to this. I've already made that public a number of times, but we are a committee and we've been given uh, one or two questions from other counselors and my colleagues can also speak up. But my recollection is the two concerns that were raised and I'm just passing these on. They're not my concerns. One has to do with the size of the sign. One counselor felt it was too large. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know if DPW has any thoughts on that. I don't. Um, and the second had to do, said, felt it was more substantial, which had to do whether the sign at the size it is in the location might obscure drivers' visions when they're making turns at that intersection. I didn't quite understand that question at the time. Maybe someone on the committee has a better sense of what that was about. But that was the other question, whether the sign would pose any kind of visibility issue for people making turns. And as I said, the other issue had to do with the size of the sign, which perhaps those two could be seen as somewhat related. Um, these are not my concerns, but I was curious whether DPW or the Amherst College people had any thoughts on the visibility issue. Um, and those are the only two that I recall, um, uh, other than, uh, uh, well, the colleagues can speak for themselves, but those are the only two that I can think of. And I really would like this to move along if we can. Yeah, I think the other question I'll ask Guilford or uh, Seth or about uh, whether any trees are affected, whether we'd have to take any uh, trees out. I I can start if you want with the yes. So from the from the standpoint of how the sign fits into the surrounding as far as size goes, um, we didn't really look at that. But as far as how it affects the operations in the public way, the size has no impact on that whatsoever. Um, the biggest issue would be sight distances if you couldn't see around the corner. Um, the sight distances are fine when you're stopped at the traffic signal. You can see before you make your movement when the light changes. And if you're making a right turn on red, you can see around the sign as well. Um, there's no impact. The sign has no impact whatsoever on sight distances from our standpoint. So we are okay with the size and the impact on the corner there. And we have also studied the um, sight lines since the town council meeting. So by standing, I went out in the traffic lanes and took photographs of the corner from where cars would be. And um, have also confirmed that there isn't a sight line concern in terms of drivers approaching that corner, seeing uh, traffic from the other approaching corners. And you said, and there are no uh, significant trees that would be affected as yeah. would. No, it's... none of the trees are affected. So George? The only other thing that I can recall, and again, I'm seeking help from my colleagues here. My, I have notes from the past meeting, but they're not ex extensive. And of course, this also was raised at a council meeting, which now is weeks and weeks ago, um, had to do with clutter and uh, sign clutter. In other words, as you're approaching the intersection from, I guess, from the south, heading north, um, there are a lot of sign, there's a lot of signage there. Again, I don't see a problem with that. It doesn't sound like DPW has a problem with that, but that was another concern that was raised. Um, whether there's just too much signage. Um, given the nature of this particular sign and its purpose, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with all the other signs that are there and it's not anywhere near them. So um, again, I don't see a problem, but anybody? So, so there is a lot of sign clutter when you come from the south and you're heading towards the center of town. And we actually plan to address that and take a couple of signs out. But that actually, as you said, doesn't affect the sign in the corner. Um, but the intersection approaching from the south, there is a, a bit of sign clutter. The state put in an extra sign, state sign. And we're going to take one of the old states. We're going to take the old state sign out and probably take out a couple more signs that we have there that aren't needed anymore and to clean that up. But that's totally a separate issue than the Amherst College sign. Paul, do you know if uh, there was any uh, discussion in our Wayfinder signs about asking Amherst College to put a uh, Wayfinder sign to point towards uh, downtown on the college that might be best placed on college land and um, 
as we're talking about signs of cooperation. Yeah, no, the actual discussion was about putting them farther away from downtown um, in terms of like, uh, there's one at the base of, at, on Northampton Road at, at the intersection with University Drive and finding a location there. Um, and, you know, there was discussion about putting a sign, trying to direct people to the downtown area. Um, but there, there is a sign there now that's, that the state put up, I think it says Amherst Center. Um, I think the, 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 there's a lot of signs <laughs> in that area and uh, it, it does, it can get confused. I think sort of a, a rationalizing some of that signage would be good. Um, and we had some discussion about coming, uh, coming west on Route 9 about putting a sign on the closer to the town common near um, Boltwood about directing people to downtown coming that direction, but I don't think that was approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Jennifer? Yeah, I just wanted to affirm what George, um, what Council, Council Ryan just um, stated that we're, we were just asked to report back to the full council whether there was obstruction um, and then the discussion about the size of the sign, um, that's just individual councilor opinions, but we were, we were asked to report back regarding whether or not the sign was uh, uh, blocking sight lines and, you know, would be a, a safety hazard. So that seems to have been answered. Thank you. Seth? Well, I just wanted to say on the subject of, of kind of college cooperation with town signs, we um, did agree when we were working, this was in 2021, with the planning board to allow um, some Amher some town of Amherst wayfinding signs per your package on our properties coming up uh, Northampton Road toward that intersection. I don't know if you've actually installed those signs or not, but we, as part of this kind of back and forth, we were um, trying to make sure that we were both signing what we both wanted to sign and not telling people to go different ways, different things. And one of those uh, compromises was to allow mm -hmm. uh, a sign on our property. I'm not sure if it's there or not, because I think the state also added a, a sign we weren't expecting there, too. Well, that sign uh, that Seth's talking about is installed. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Yeah, and I'd also just like to point out to my colleagues on the committee that we have the memorandum dated August 26, 2021, which points out the Historical Commission expressed strong positive recommendation for this prominent gateway sign, seeing it as an improvement. And we have a design review statement that the board is satisfied with the design layout and location of the sign is submitted. So we have DPW, Historical Commission, Design Review Board, um, and I have the sense there are no more questions. I, for the sake of the Amherst College representatives who are here this morning, Hopefully they will not have to come back again, and hopefully this committee will finally move on this, um, unless someone has other concerns, which I'm not hearing. Um, and so that's my final thought on this. Uh, Councilor Ryan, it sounds like you're ready to make a motion. Do you need help raising that? Say that, too. Um, that would be very much appreciated, Athena. To recommend the council approve the Amherst College request to place a sign in the public way on the South Common at the corner of South Pleasant Street and route nine that is my motion thank you athena second second, second. Jennifer, second. You second it. okay there's been motion made and seconded is there any further discussion hearing seeing no request for other discussion um take a vote and uh start with uh up hegner yes and uh, George Ryan? Aye. Uh, Ryan. Jennifer? Yes. And I'll vote yes. So it's four to zero. Uh, we will, um, the, the motion has passed and we will report that back to the council. I want to thank uh, Sarah and Seth for being here and um, we'll let you go. Thank, thank you. you, everyone, for your time this morning. All right. Thank you.
So um, turning then Guilford to the other item that we're here for, that Tracy introduced us to a little bit earlier um, when she was with the meeting reporting for TAC. Um, do you have any, do you want to begin a presentation or uh, how would you like to go? So I think maybe everybody, but Councillor Hegner has seen the plans. So if you want, I can go through the plans and talk about what we're doing, or I can just start talking. I, I think since it's been so long since the council saw this, it'd be good just to walk through the whole thing. Athena, can and, you and, 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 and prioritize what you are look, looking for right now. Yeah. Um, do you have, would you work on the entire section at once or do you going to do this in uh, part? So you're, and I gather that uh, the hope is to fund it through the, the block grant. Yes. So actually if Athena, if you could bring up the plan, I'll just walk through what we're, what the plan is and then what, how it gets staged. Sure. Do you want um, the pictures in the memo or which? You can do it. You can do the pictures in the memo. That's just that. Those are fine. Okay. All right. Great. So th this project has been on the DPW books for um, well, as long as I've been here, it's been on our books. Um, this this project grew out of a, an attempt to have a path, a multi-use bike path that went from the campus to North Amherst and from North Amherst to the campus. Um, originally, they wanted it off-road um, and they wanted it to run behind the apartments, between the apartments and 116. Uh, there's a there's sort of a dirt path there now, a, a cinder path road, they call it. Um, but that became very difficult to do. Um, some of the apartment complexes were opposed to it because it opened up multiple um, access points, which they had to control into their um, complexes. Is there a picture, Athena? Athena, yeah, we lost the picture. So, so this is how um, this is how the project started. As time went on, we realized we really can't go down this path, which goes on the cinder road and then goes down um, under some power lines. And we decided to move a multi-use path to North Pleasant Street. And so that's how we started this. Um, <clears throat> we had it surveyed. Uh, town town meeting approved money to survey the the layout, so that was done. And then we developed the concept plan, which you see here. Um, we it's been presented once before to the to I think it's been presented to the to the town council council and the select board. So at the I think one of the last meetings of the select board, they saw it as well. Um, it's a combination of sidewalk upgrades, sidewalk. Uh, renovations and then new crosswalks and upgraded bus pull-offs is what we have here. Um, your memo of concerning the public way points out clearly that the council has to approve crosswalks and major reno renovations. Uh, we really don't, it's just, we don't really consider this a major renovation of the sidewalks, even though we're widening some of them. Um, they are in the exact same place. They're just getting a little wider, but the crosswalks are new. We do have new crosswalks. That's why, that's probably why we're, we're talking about this. All the bus stops are being up, updated. Um, so that's not really a new thing as well. So we kind of, um, so that's kind of how it's come about. So as you look at the project, um, we're starting at this sheet here. We're looking, we're starting at Old Town Road, Old Town Road and in front of UMass. At this section of the project, we're gonna have a five foot sidewalk on the west side, which is the top of the page, and an eight foot sidewalk on the east side of the project, which is the bottom of the page. So we'll go through, can you, can you go back up to the top of the page? 
<clears throat> these two bus stops do get improved. One bus stop is exactly where it was before. The other bus stop never had a pull off. We kind of placed it in a spot that worked really well. Some neighbors aren't really thrilled about that bus stop being there, but since, uh, but that's where we propose the bus stop. A PVTA always asks us to put the, the crosswalk behind the bus stops if we pair bus stops. Um, this actually allows the students or the passengers to walk to the back, cross the road, and as they're crossing the road and their cars are yielding to the students, the bus can pull out and that they like that. Um, that's how that, that's why the bus stops, we like, we set them up the way they do with one, once they're, the, the bus stop will be past the crosswalk and the crosswalk will be behind the bus stop in the direction of travel. So you can scroll down now. So now we're moving, we're moving north. Um, we still have the, on the east side or the bottom of the page, we have the eight foot wide sidewalk, five foot wide sidewalk on the other side. Um, just keep scrolling down. Uh, well, that's hard to see, but we still have this, the same layout in here where um, <clears throat> eight foot on the east side, five foot on the other side. There's no real changes in here. It's just the sidewalks are wider. Scroll down some more. And we're now we're going past uh, presidential par presidential apartments here. It's still the same layout. You can scroll down more. And now we're at uh, UMass Housing, and we're at um, Hobart Lane. At this point in the project, um, right now <clears throat> there's uh, an adjustment in the in the crosswalk here. We moved it back. We also upgraded it with RFBs. Um, and this is one, uh, one option for this intersection with the two apartment complexes is to have a regular four-way intersection. As we go down farther down the pages, you'll see there's an option here to put a um, roundabout in here to slow people down. This is also where we push the wider sidewalk to the west side of the project. And we push, uh, we make the east side of the project a five foot wide sidewalk it just <clears throat> it's mostly done this way because it fits better in the right of way we do have to get right away from adjacent property owners but we get less right we have to get less property from the adjacent property owners doing it this way so <clears throat> as we scroll down some more well, that's not hobart that's crestview sorry <laughs> so keep going so then as we here is a section here we are the same. We have the bigger sidewalk on the west side and a smaller sidewalk on the east side. Um, at Ho this is at the Puffton Village. So we're proposing a community development block grant project that'll start at the south entrance to um, Puffton Village and go north to where we stopped last year with the sidewalk work. So this is the section that we're proposing for this year or next year to be constructed. Um, it'll go from the south, as I said, the south entrance to Puffton North to the work we've already done. Um, and in this area, as you can see, there is a new crosswalk at the, <clears throat> there's a new crosswalk at the um, entrance to, Puff, the north entrance to Puffton. That's not there now. Um, that will also have RFBs with it. Um, like I said before, the west sidewalk is eight foot wide, the east sidewalk is five foot wide. And you can, okay, and that's, uh, well, we're, that page, this page is a little out of place, but can you skip this page? So then once we leave the pup, once we leave the two driveways from Puffton, we'll continue working up North Pleasant Street to where we stopped before. And that is in the area of Fisher Street. Um, the other thing we're adding at Fisher Street is a crosswalk, which wasn't there. There was no crosswalk at Fisher Street. This is a new crosswalk. Um, and there's our fees at this crosswalk as well. So the project, the construction project we have proposed for a community development block grant just goes from Fisher Street to the southernmost. Puffton driveway, and it just includes that section of road. 
And then if you scroll down more, you can see the part that was constructed last year. This piece has already been done at the bottom page. So that's the overall project. Um, if you want to go up to the page we skipped over. So th this is not proposed for this year's project, but this is an option for the Crestview apartments and the, the well, it used to be married housing. It has a new name for it, but I haven't said it enough to be used to it. Um, this is a proposed uh, alternate um, intersection proposal is put a roundabout in here. Um, it would uh, it, it would work really well as a traffic coming method, um, we believe, and we would really like to do it, but we're not, it's not in the construction schedule for this year. So that's kind of the project. Um, those are the major things we're talking about. Um, any questions? Jennifer? Um, yes, well, a couple of questions. The first was about um, the crosswalks being behind the bus stops. <clears throat> when Tracy Zafian made her presentation and what's in our written report from TAC, they are very um, kind of adamant they are, that it is much safer. It's been proven, you know, traffic experts say it's much safer to have the crosswalks in front of the bus stops. So it sounds like the bus drivers prefer it, but in terms of, you know, um, measurable traffic safety, protocols that the bus, that the crosswalk should be in front. So I wanted to ask about that. Um, PB, PBTA prefers to have them at the back. So that's how we set it up for the drivers. It does make it easier for the buses to actually pull out because most automobile drivers, once they, once the bus pulls off on the bus side and there's no pedestrians crossing the road, they just do not let the bus out. When you see the proposals for um, Belchertown Road, there are no bus pull-offs at the bus stops because the traffic is so heavy there that the buses cannot pull out of pull-offs on Belchertown Road. So it's kind of a it's kind of a toss-up uh, whether you can get the public transit to work better or whether you have better safety. We we kind of like having them behind as well because it actually if people are using it. Um, it, it does give the drivers of the vehicles a better <laughs> sight of the pedestrian, whereas if you don't see the pedestrian and the bus is just pulled over and you don't see a car coming, there are cars that will pull around the bus and try to pass. I and mean, if there's a pedestrian in front of a bus and steps out and gets hit, well, if there's a pedestrian in front of the bus, they're not as easily to be seen by the people passing the bus. So we kind of prefer the way it is. And if you, it's yeah, Jennifer. Did yeah, you... I mean, I this is I, I'm not a traffic safety expert, so I just feel torn because we have traffic safety experts on tack and they're very adamant that it's you know safer, it's been proven to be safer to have the pedestrians in the front. So I'm just trying to picture pedestrian is crossing behind the bus. Would a car from the other direction? see them? Wouldn't the cars coming from the other opposite direction see them better if they were in front of the bus? If you're coming towards the bus, you'll see the pedestrian better. If you're coming from behind the bus, you'll see the pedestrian better. So it's kind of a six, it's kind of a toss up. I've seen the stuff that I've seen the studies that Tracy's pointing to, and I really, they don't seem to have as much play or impact in, in our area. It's more there are also mostly a lot of double lane roads that are looking at, um, stuff like that. So um, we have not, the people who have been hit while trying to cross the road at a bus stop have been out of the crosswalks. And they would be out of the crosswalks if they were immediately at the bus stops. So um, we think we have a good system here and we should keep with it. We don't wanna really change that. If PVTA comes back and says they don't want it, We'll change it then, but it works really well. Um, thank you. I have one other question. Can I ask? Um, it was about um, Old Town, the Old Town Road bus stop. I guess I listened in on, on a number of the ZBA hearings when it was about a um, complementary dwelling project, a special permit, and the um, neighborhood 
the Farview Lane and the, I guess Old Town Road neighborhood did have a lot of concerns about that bus stop. Is that, and that was a concern about where you were going to move it to or where it was. So it has the neighborhood, I mean, has there been any further discussion with the neighborhood on that? Does that, I don't know if any of the residents from the neighborhoods are, you know, in the audience at this meeting, they might not have realized it was on the agenda, but the, I just want to raise that for the residents that aren't here. There's been, there's been more discussion. We talked about sliding the bus stop farther down the road or farther north so that you could make, keep the driveway where it was. The concern was the driveway would move to Old Town and it'd be more traffic on Old Town. Um, but we actually, it's not shown this because this is an old concept plan. We can move the bus stop to the north and still keep our layout with the two bus stops and still keep the driveway for the apartment complex where it was. And then it's, and there was that's no what other, the residents would prefer. And there was no other conversation after they withdrew their application. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, um, I just had a question about the bikes. Uh, are they to go on the, the road or will they go on the sidewalks? You'll have the option of being on the multi-use path, which is the wider sidewalk, or being in the road is what you'll have the choice of. Okay, so so they would have to switch over from the west to the east at some point, <clears throat> where you <throat> change the multi. So, is there a crosswalk there? Yes, there's a there's a proposal for a crosswalk at that, and if it goes to a roundabout, there'll be two crosswalks. Okay. Um. So yeah, I mean, so. It would basically be two-way bicycle traffic. Is that correct? Uh, on on the paths, it would be. Okay. And pedestrians. Yes. So that that's a having walked the rail trail. <laughs> it's uh. It's sometimes people go go by pretty fast. They don't they don't always signal. But that's a that's a different story. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That's all right. Yeah, uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, first, uh, coming off of what Jennifer was talking about and what's in the memo that TAC has provided us, and I hope everyone had a chance to read because it's quite detailed and I think very helpful. I know Guilford has seen it. Um, the bus stop location issue, I think looking at what the maps show us today and listening to Guilford, I can see that that probably the way I've laid it out makes the most sense. I would think the, that the fact that each of these crosswalks would have flashing lights, I forget the R, you know, there's some four letter acronym that you guys use. RRFB. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, they would be at all these locations. So I would think the lights, first of all, would be crucial. It's a two lane road, um, other traffic calming. I really like the idea of the roundabout. Um, not that it would impact all of the crosswalks, obviously, but anything to calm traffic uh, on that stretch, perhaps eventually we could look at even lowering the speed limit. Um, so I think I see the challenge that Guilford faces, and I think the solution they offer is probably the, the best that we can do. And I think there are other factors that actually would affect safety more than the, the location of the, of the crosswalk, um, is my amateur's take on that. Um, lighting was raised in the um, the TAC memo. I know there's no, I think in your memo, you point out there's nothing about lighting in this, um, but that does seem to be an important safety factor um, in terms of all kinds of things. Um, I don't know if there's anything you can say about whether that's something that could happen in the future or whether, um, but that seems to be a concern about the lighting. And uh, so maybe I'll let you, do, is there anything you can say about lighting Guilford other than it's not in the memo, so we're not going to talk about it? <laughs> it's it's not in the concept here. Um, okay. Right. The easiest way, if you want to add lighting to this street, is overhead lighting um, on poles that are fed by a wire, overhead wire. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, that being said, it would be, it would be possible to, uh, to come back at a later point and put in light new more additional lighting if that's what people want to do. Okay. And then if you if if you could just for my sake, um, very briefly, just go back over the staging. I 
if I understand you, and I probably didn't, um, you're going to be working from the northern end, from where you finish some work at the northern end, and you're going to proceed southerly, and you're going to go as far as... The second Puffton driveway. Second Puffton driveway. And you have money for this, so it's just a matter of getting approval and then proceeding with the work. It's being submitted as a community development block grant wow. okay. project. So if it's approved okay. as that, we'll be able to proceed. And when do you think that might happen? If assuming it's approved as a CDBG grant, when when might could this happen in this coming construction season, or we're we talking a year from now, or it would be for it would be for next fiscal year. So it That's could it. start as early as October first if the money comes in and we bid it before we get the money. If we okay. if we get it told we're going to get the money, we could bid it and then we could start as early as October first if we wanted to, or we could wait and do it next season. Okay. And then the remaining piece of this, uh, and I want to really reinforce uh, something that that I think has been said already, how important this project is. You've been at it for years now. Um, it's it's a heavily traveled area. We've had a fatality here, um, and I'm just really happy to see that this is moving forward, and I hope it can go as quickly as humanly possible. But the uh, would there then be a third piece? So it's basically going to be in three stages, or yeah, it could be three or four stages. Um depending on how much money is available, we could finish it in one stage. If there's not enough money, then we can divide it into two stages and work our way through. If we, if people really want the roundabout, then, then the cost goes up a bit. Yep. Um, so that would be an impact to the project. And then I'll shut up, but I, I think the roundabout is a great idea um, and for many reasons, um, but traffic calming would be the most important one. And I hope that if this does go forward, that that could be included. But um, thank you, Gilford, for making that clear. Thanks. Welcome. Jennifer. Yeah, um, along the lines, uh, picking up on the financing piece, has the university been engaged at UMass in a conversation about since this really, I know it's a public road, but it runs through the campus of contributing to um, defraying the cost for the town. So the university has been, uh, they actually put some money forward to help us do some other work in this corridor. This project had already been kind of laid out and we're pretty kind of comfortable and we think this is the way to go with this end of the project. Uh, there will be some additional uh, work we do, mostly in the section of North Pleasant Street through campus, but we may overlap and come into the section that hasn't been done yet up to um, I'm going to call it married student housing, but it's not married student housing. Um, to look at that, they've set some money aside for that, and we've begun talking about how to how to put that project together and look at that. So that is something that is coming again. But you think the CDBG grant, what you, the amount you're requesting, would cover? It's this the CDB. You know, will cover the section we're, we're proposing. Yes. But without the roundabout, that that doesn't the section we're proposing doesn't doesn't include the area where the roundabout would be. So it's a few, that's a decision to be made in the future. Yes, I know the university and the town are, I think, together uh, putting in an application for a roundabout at Amity and University. Yes, you'll so see maybe those. They could do this. Yeah, they do the same at this roundabout. If it because they seem to feel it helped having the university <laughs> on board mm -hmm. and, and helping to advocate for it with the state. Yes, you'll see those plans shortly, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just had a, a question about the crosswalks. Uh, do, do you intend to raise them like the ones that are on Route 9 by Amherst College or just would they just be flat? Because that's another way to calm traffic. It, it is another way to calm traffic, but this is a this is the major thoroughfare for uh, emergency responses. Um, we try not to, unless there's a uh, alternate route close by, like Main Street was just right right over from Amherst Col for College Street, so you could kind of get around it without too much delay. Um, we try not to put raised or vertical traffic calming in areas which is going to have a lot of ambulance and fire apparatuses moving on them. Fair enough. <laughs> So uh, one of the questions that I had had been posed now by other members of the committee, so thank you. Um, 
the one thing, one of the things that was raised in the TAC memo was the question of about lighting specifically at the crosswalks. That um, just the flashing lights alone uh, are not ad adequate always to provide safety. Is there any thought to at least doing limited lighting in those sections? Even though, as I've looked at it, there are other sections where there's uh, lighting that could be a problem for safety. Um, and, and this light, and this is one there's not, but it's not an issue. If we just look at the crosswalks and look at lighting, that's something we can do pretty pretty easily, and we do throughout the town. So we could do that as we go through the project. It would be overhead wire, and it'd be overhead uh, poles if we did add a new lighting. So that's not part of the current plan and there's not funding for it at the moment. That correct? We, we would take the funding if we decide we need to improve the light, we would just take it from the normal lighting fundings we funding we have every year and do it. Okay. Um is uh getting back to the multi-use path uh question uh, is uh, eight feet really sufficient for bicycles going both ways and pedestrians being safe walking so that that is a that is a, a great question and people debate this constantly um one of the re one of the things that um we're one of the things we're saying here is that you know most comfortable or most experienced bike riders are not going to ride on the multi-use path they're gonna stay in the road. So the faster, more confident bicyclists will stay there. What this does is allow for the bicyclists that are not confident and that are just trying to commute back and forth and are not really the, but not really the heavy bicyclists, it gives them a place to be. Um, and then, but they are mixed with the pedestrians and sometimes that does cause a problem. But as people get more confident, we would hope that they would then get back on the road and you would be able to, educate and build a better biking community by having this one one opportunity to buy to ride on the sidewalk for a while and then when you're ready to get onto the road so that's kind of the goal um, and because there is the the room for riding on the road here that that should work well if this was a bike path if this is a multi-use path by itself with no other road around we would say it needed to be bigger. We'd be 12, we're talking 12 or 14 feet, and we'd be trying to do some more delineation about lanes and so forth on the bike path. So um, what you're looking for is a recommendation from the committee to the council on at least the crosswalks um, and to report that we've looked at the plan as a whole. Yes, and if you just want, if you wanted to easily just say you approve the concept between Fisher and uh, South Driveway of Huffton Village, and that you want to talk about the rest at a later time, that would be fine. Um, that would get us through this piece of it, and then we could talk. Or you can say we we agree with the concept wholeheartedly, and you should move forward with everything, including the roundabout. Um. But the um, Andy, the request in the memo was to approve the conceptual plan titled North Pleasant Street Pedestrian Improvements and show, uh, consisting of the four pages showing improvements to the sidewalks, crosswalks, and bus stops along North Pleasant from Pine to Eastman Lane. So the uh, request doesn't include the roundabout at this time. Pine to Eastman. Doesn't is the entire distance, uh -huh. right? But doesn't include the request. Doesn't include the roundabout. So the, the roundabout um, image that we were sent was there. Just FYI, it wasn't actually part of the proposal. So it's the the four pages showing improvements. It's it's only the sidewalks, crosswalks, and bus stops along North Pleasant, not the roundabout. Okay. Uh, 
Paul, did you have something? Yeah, I know your hand is yes. up. Yes, I, yeah, so the the request, is, as Althina said, is is all the way from Eastman Lane to Pine Street, Meadow Street area. Um, if we can get conceptual you know, of the conceptual plan, those things change over time as you get into the field. We know that the construction, um, in case funds come available sooner, and we, it, rather than come back every time we get a bit of money or there's some funds available, um, knowing what direction we're going to through going to in this t entire stretch of um, North Pleasant Street is, is important. So I would ask that you do the entire section without the roundabout. We can comment on the roundabout, but it's not part of the motion. It doesn't need to be part of the motion. Uh -huh. Councillor Ryan? Well, with Athena's help again, I would be willing to make a motion to that effect um, that excluding the roundabout, um, pretty much what Paul just and Gilfrey has just said, um, I would move that we approve uh, the concept plan. I think Athena could word that a lot better than I just did, but I'm willing um, to, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm gonna, go so I'm going to suggest that you move to approve the conceptual plan titled North Pleasant Street Pedestrian Improvements dated April 1. I'm sorry, move to recommend the council approve. The conceptual plan titled North Pleasant Street Pedestrian Improvements dated April 1, 2021, consisting of four pages showing improvements to the sidewalks, crosswalks, and bus stops along North Pleasant Street from Pine Street to Eastman Lane. And I would suggest that um, the committee's uh, memo to the town council could include discussion on the roundabout, but that wouldn't be a part of your recommendation. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Hagner. So Bob is seconded. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Because the other thing that I would uh, probably suggest including, aside from discussion of the roundabout, is discussion of the lighting question that Tech has uh, recommended. And I think that there was two questions I was just going to ask Gilford. At this point, are there any sections that are not sidewalked, at least to some extent, going in either on either side of the street, or is it continuous? There's sidewalk on North Pleasant Street all the way from Eastman to Pine Street. Okay, because the reason I asked that is in the tech memo, there was reference to a section but there was not sidewalked when they did the initial inspection, but that, that was years ago. No, so, that's, there's all there's always been sidewalk. I so. just... Some of them are fairly narrow. I've driven it recently, and that some of them are fairly narrow. And I think that there is a question as to whether there um, is some overgrown plantings that are interfering with the sidewalk. Yes, that's what they talk about in their memo is that you, the, some of the sidewalk is lost because of the overgrowth grown overgrowth. Would, would that be uh, addressed when when the work is done or does that need to be addressed uh, through the application of the uh, policy as they suggest? Um, most in the sections we're working on, it'll be addressed. Uh, in other sections, it should be addressed through the the town's uh, bylaws concerning blocking of the sidewalks. And we don't uh, what sections they are, and really would have to come up through the inspections department, I would assume. Yes, that's how it's set up now. Yeah, Councilor Ryan. Anything else? Yeah, just quickly following up on your thoughts for the memo that will go to the council. I agree um, mentioning lighting would be uh, something to mention. Again, the TAC memo is quite helpful there. Um, the other, I thought, just a suggestion to you when you write it, uh, perhaps also mentioning um, an idea of further traffic calming uh, steps that might be taken, including reducing the speed limit as things to think about. We're not taking any formal position on that. We'll be looking at this issue, I think, in town-wide fairly soon, but I don't know if you'd like to mention that as well. But I would love to see that area um, with a much lower speed limit, um, given the density and the connection to the university. But that's just a suggestion. 
Yeah, we need to have a good discussion about speed limits as a separate issue because there's several statutes that are involved with that. And uh, so maybe just the word traffic calming. It's a thought. Yeah, I, it's all right, it's your memo. I don't know what else you do. The traffic calming. Uh, well, I could stand out there and just you know, be, tell people to slow down. But uh, I, I agree that the traffic, uh, the idea of a roundabout. Uh -huh. we, help for that section in particular, as I think it has very successfully, thanks to hard work of Guilford and the rest of us, uh, our employees of getting that roundabout installed with Pomeroy Lane. I think that has been very helpful too. We have a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Um, if there's uh, no hands going up about further discussion, then uh, we'll Go ahead and vote mm -hmm. on the motion. And uh, so, uh, Jennifer? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Bob Hegner? Yes. And I have a vote. Yes. So, again, it is a unanimous vote. And uh, so, with that, uh, I think. I don't know if anybody from the committee has anything else while Gilford, Gilford's here that they want to ask him, because otherwise, no, we would like to let employees go. George, I'm not, gonna let, I'm not going to let Gilford go so easily. Um, it's always a pleasure to have his presence, and when we have his presence, we can ask him all kinds of fun questions. And at our last meeting, we had Rob Mora here, and I think Jennifer was joining me in this, but I can't. It's been so long now, I can't remember. But uh, and we may never see snow again, um, and it seems almost perverse to talk about it on a day like today. Um, but it's still March. Who knows? And it's New England. Um, Guilford, the issue rose with uh, when your your guys are cleaning, uh, you know, doing the uh, sidewalks with snow removal um, at certain intersections, uh, especially the one we were thinking of was Amity and uh, Lincoln. Um, they at least in this one case, and perhaps in other cases too. They sometimes leave the snow piled up such that if you're a pedestrian wanting to cross at the crosswalk that you have, particularly at the Lincoln and Amity intersection, you put in those lovely lights and it, I use it now all the time, um, and, but you couldn't use it during the past and maybe only snowstorm of the year because they had basically dumped all the snow right in the way. And the argument was, well, the homeowners would come out and clear it. And A, there were, wasn't any real homeowner anywhere nearby, and B, I think that's a bit much to ask homeowners to do. So the question was whether, uh, to Rob, was what what's the what what can we do about that? And of course, he punted it to to you guys, um, and said he would get back to you, which I doubt he did, because um, he's busy just like you are. So since you're here, the question is, uh, what's the instruction to your 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 plow folks who are doing the sidewalks? And is it made clear to them that they should make every effort to keep those areas clear? Is it impossible to do that? Um, it seems like it's not, but what do I know? So that's my question for you. Um, assuming we ever have a snowstorm again um, of that magnitude, what would be the instructions to them to uh, you know try to keep those areas clear? Is that something you could do? Is it? I, that's the question. We we talk to them all the time about being. Well, the way I, the way we talk here about it is is that you know you need to be polite to your fellow employee who's doing the sidewalk plowing, so you need to work in the trucks. We need to work to keep trying to keep it open, and trying to push things away from any of the known crosswalks. Uh, we do have a lot of new employees this year, so they don't they're still learning the town. We've been having a probably the last three four years. We have a lot of new employees that are plowing. Um, so sometimes it gets forgotten. Um, they might do it the first two times and then they forget and then it backs up. Uh, and then we sometimes, most of the time, we will all send the snow plow, the sidewalk plow out again to try to clear it, or we'll send a loader to just try to clear it. Um, so if it's really one of the bigger intersections, just give us a call. Um, mm -hmm. And Rob can give us a call too and say, this one's kind of backed up and we'll just go get it. Um, that's kind of how it is right now. I, I wish the guys could figure out how to do it, but some of them just, they forget or they get tired. Sure. So better, better communication. When it see, when I saw it happen right away, I just need to get on the phone or, and just reach out or somebody reach out and say, please, this is a problem. Please get out. I'm sure you will. 
Okay. Yeah, you know, it's uh, kind of how it works. And Good. but I think, but again, some of the some of the ones we don't we we kind of try to concentrate on the major ones. We don't sure. the ones that are way off in the middle of nowhere. Hey, I would. I, that's not way off in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, this is a major one. It's, I have it's to a say. major, major, major intersection. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's like that. That's the road out of town, man. That's not even a big one. <laughs> It's a big one. <laughs> Anything else that anybody wants to raise with Guilford today? Because I appreciate that uh, you're reminding us that we did talk about snow plowing because I think most of us forgotten snow. <laughs> I'm hoping for one more big snowstorm. Oh boy. Okay. Right. Well, we'll put it to the test. All right. We've had them in April. We have. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I guess, uh, thank you, Guilford. Yeah. Guilford, thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. And we will turn it back to Paul now because um, I don't know if, uh, if you have an order that you would like to present the um, appointments in. So, as a courtesy to Melissa, since she's mm -hmm. here, let's, if we could do the CRESS director first, it's the biggest appointment. Is that okay? Andy? I think that's fine. So I'm really pleased to present uh, as the new Crest Director, Community, Director of Community Responders for Equity, Safety, and Service. And if, if you haven't met Melissa, I think most of you have, but Melissa's our HR Director. She's been here for a while now, so she seems like, you know, but just in case, because we're doing these virtually so so much. So Camille Theriak is um, the new um, Crest Director that I have appointed, and I'm asking for your support for her appointment. Uh, Camille brings, it's a really um, unique skill set where um, she was a, a lieutenant in the Holyoke Fire Department and um, the first uh, female lieutenant and the first black female lieutenant, obviously, in, um, in Holyoke. And she's um, had the, um, so she has a public safety background. When she um, ended her career as a firefighter, she went to um, graduate school at the Massachusetts, at the uh, Smith School of, for Social Work and got her MSW and is a licensed social worker. So she brings both a public safety and a social work um, background to uh, the position. Um, the, um, and that's and that's a skill set we you know the, the town had decided early on that under, based on this community safety working group recommendation that this, this department be placed in public safety. So that's something that we've really, um, pioneered and most of these departments are placed, placed in public health or community services areas. Um, and we've really been working hard to build the relationship between the fire department, police department, uh, dispatch and, and, and crest. And that's been, you know, going well. I think she will help, um, with that communication. Melissa, you want to talk about the process or anything like that? Sure. I'll just say that we had a eight person committee, um, I think five of those people were from the community and um, uh, we inter I think we had a pool of over 21 candidates. We interviewed eight of them and referred uh, four of those candidates to second round interviews. All in all, we ended up doing three rounds of interviews as well as meet and greets with the responders with a feedback loop. And in the end, Camille came out um, as a top choice. I, um, I agree with Paul that her background in both public safety and mental health is unique. Her demeanor um, coupled with that experience really makes her a choice candidate. Um, it wasn't an easy decision because we had a really competitive pool, but I think we have the right person. Let me open it up to the committee to see if there are any questions. The uh, interesting thing that I saw, of course, you've talked about public safety and um, the fire EMS is very much a part of obviously public safety, but it is not the police department. Uh, did you get a good feeling for um, how she will relate with uh, police since that is uh, the department that I think may be most important of the two? Well, interestingly, both departments are important. Uh, we're utilize the fire department's been very supportive of the CRUST program. We're utilizing a lot of their reporting um, systems that they use because it, it's more, uh, 
conducive to how they when they file reports we're we're logging logging on to their system because um their experience with it they're training our um, employees they, they um so and i think that in this town which is kind of unusual in most communities there's a mutual respect between fire and police and those departments get along really famously in our community which is not the case in most communities and that's a, I think that's a tribute to the leadership of those two departments. And I think she will have the re, an instant respect of the different departments um, as opposed to being someone strictly from a social work background. That's Ryan. I think this is a, an impressive candidate. And um, I think the process is also equally impressive. And so I congratulate Paul and uh, HR and on the process and uh, the candidate they presented. I was particularly uh, struck by the fact that she does have some mental health background. She also has a degree in social work. And I've long felt that this is an area that, um, um, I don't know if one thinks of that as public safety per se, but I think it's an area in which um, press can do a great deal of work. I described to Paul an incident that occurred about a week or two ago uh, when a, a young woman came to my door um, I live on Dana Street. She was walking up Amity Street from uh, the Big Y. She lives in the downtown. Um, she had two bags of groceries with her. She had just done her shopping. And a person who was clearly mentally disturbed had uh, seen her and was following her and shouting. She became quite upset. And so she just by accident, she didn't know who I was, but she ended at my doorstep. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's an example of the kinds of things that happen. Paul and I also happened the other day just to be meeting and a young man was standing right outside the, the, the uh, near the black sheep and again mentally disturbed and shouting and yelling at the top of his voice. Um, and so we have these kinds of experiences in town and, you know, it's not clear what we do. Um, I actually ended up walking down to the police station afterwards and just reporting the incident just to see, you know, but it's really not a police response. Whose response is it? And it, you know, what do we do um, when someone is actually um, being harassed or, or in that way? So I was pleased to see that she has that background and hopefully she'll have some thoughts and ideas about how Crest can be involved in that and also how we can instruct the public in what to do uh, or not to do in those circumstances. Because I've had two now in the last uh, couple of weeks where I was personally involved. My wife also has had encounters on Amity Street um, with another individual who also is mentally disturbed, who uh, I just saw the other day, often walks up and down the, the actual roadway. He doesn't walk on the sidewalk, he walks in the roadway. Um, so um, this is, you know, not a common phenomenon, but it's one that's real. So um, I'm pleased to see that she has this background and I'm looking forward to um, her thoughts and, and the way in which Crest can be involved in this. Jennifer? Uh, yeah, just echoing George, I think it's, um, we're very fortunate to have a, a candidate and who has accepted the position who comes with a public safety um, and a mental health uh, background. So um, I look forward to meeting the new press director. Uh -huh. Councilor Ryan. So I'm prepared to make a motion if you are ready for that. I think we were ready for a motion. So I move to uh, um, recommend that the town council approve the town manager's appointment of Camille Theriac as director of community responders for equity, safety, and service. Second. Did you hear? You seconding the motion? Yeah, I seconded the motion, yeah. Okay. So if the motion has been made and seconded, I think there's been plenty of discussion. If there are no hands going up, uh, then I'll go ahead and move to a vote. Start with Councillor Ryan. Aye. Councillor Hegner. Aye. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And I'm an aye, so it's four to zero. And thank you very much. Uh, and I think that uh, this is a uh, somebody who is great promise and really pleased with the process. So thank you. So, Paul, back to you. You have some committee appointments. We had public comment on one of the committee appointments. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go through them alphabetically. So the next one is, thank you, um, Melissa, for being here. Yeah, I don't think we need Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, 
for Conservation Commission, uh, the appointment is Rachel Loeffler. Uh, Ms. Loeffler is a town resident, which is great, and also a registered landscape architect who has extensive work in the um, Western Mass area, working for, as one of the principal of Berkshire Design. Um, she has followed a lot of the work of the, of the Conservation Commission and um, especially with a special interest in um, climate change and how that's impacting some of the decisions that we're making as a town and uh, individual property owners have to make as well as we take into account rising groundwater and things like that. So um, so I recommend uh, appointed up for your consideration, Rachel Loeffler. So are there any questions, Bob, or Councilor Ryan? I'm ready to make a motion uh, unless someone has something they wish to uh, to ask or to say. Uh, I'll just say something. Um, Please, Bob. I'm I'm very pleased that um, she's um, focused on uh, the rainfall events that occur due to climate change, and uh, it's one of, been one of my issues that I've noticed. Just I've had to put <laughs> put rocks down beneath one of my downspouts because the, the rain is so bad now that it just over it comes off the roof and over overwhelms my my gutters so um mm. everyone who is a homeowner needs to you know is probably going to have to adjust something because of the rainfall so just wanted to point that out it's an issue yes but we do you have made a motion right well, I'm going to make a motion if okay. you're willing to entertain it. Um, yes. So I move to recommend the town council approve the town manager appointment of Rachel Loeffler for a term to expire June 30, 2027 to the um, Conservation Commission um, as uh, filed with the town clerk on March 12, 2024. Sir, so right, Athena. Great job. Thank you. I'll second. I, I second. second. Uh, okay, motion's been made and seconded. And if there's no further discussion, I see your hand is still up, but I assume that's not for further discussion. So I will proceed to a vote. Um, Bob. Aye. <laughs> I'm going to vote aye. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. And Councilor Ryan? Aye. So it is unanimous. Paul, back to you. Thank you. The next appointment is for, hand up for something. Oh. Jennifer? Uh, yes, I don't, want, I don't want to interrupt the process, but I did want to make a comment. Not, It's not directed at Paul, <laughs> but it it's just that I wanted to state that, and I just brought this up in GOL last term, that I do have questions about the process and why the town council appointed committees, which is the ZBA, the planning board and the finance committee is so different than the committee's members that are appointed by the town manager in that the council committees, it's all completely transparent every, because we would be violating open meeting law to not have it be. It's the public is aware of who's applying. The public sees all the statements of interest. They see the community activity forms, which are the applications. The interviews are part of a public meeting as are the deliberation and the selection process. So I, I do share the concern and I should probably know this, whether it's part of our charter and if this is something the charter committee could address but it, um, I don't feel, I've never felt comfortable with a process where the applicants are not known because it does feel like, and this is my first time on TSO. So I might've thought that TSO had more information before they made the recommendation to the council, but we really can't do anything other than rubber stamp <laughs> because of the way it's structured. So I, with the elementary school building committee, I, I happen to know who the other applicants are because they made themselves known to me. I don't know who any of the applicants were for any of these other committees, but I do think there is a, there is a structural problem with the process. 
and I this may not be the committee to discuss it, but I, I do throw out the question, is this something that the Charter Review Committee, it would be in their purview to address? I, I have that question. If anyone, maybe the town manager can answer that. Well, I'm not sure what would be in the Charter Charter Review Committee, but so I think the difference is that uh, with a council appointment, it's a council appointment. It's a public body making an appointment, whereas the town manager is an individual making the appointment, and I can consult who I would like. Athena has her hands up. She's probably going to say it's not on the agenda, so maybe I'll defer to her. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to scold you as part of my comments, but that, that okay. wasn't the only thing. The, the, this, this issue had come up at TSO in the past, and I think what um, members had asked the town manager to present as part of his appointment was the number of applicants and the um, the demographics of the applicants um, because the community activity forms aren't public records. Um, and so that seemed acceptable to members at the time. And that was the extent of the, the conversation at the time. I think that, um, and of course it is in the charter and the charter has a resident advisory committee and Paul might ex talk about the resident advisory committee and how that factors in, but uh, the charter is uh, designating the appointments made by the town manager go in this fashion. And uh, we do have uh, all of the barriers that are there, including the question of whether the uh, citizen activity forms are a uh, matter of public record or not. Um, and that has been discussed in prior councils because um, I think there is a difference in how Northampton has deal, deal, dealt with it in a similar day. Uh, I think their citizen activity forms um, explicitly say on them that they are not, um, that they are um, open to the public. They are public records, ours do not. Um, so there's a whole lot of issues that fall there. I do think that uh, the point that it's not on the agenda, we probably ought to not get into a big discussion about it today, but if we want to talk about that issue, place it on the future agenda. Jennifer? Or yeah, no, I would like to place it on the future agenda because I have more questions. So, Dina, your, your hand is still up. Did you have anything more you want to say on this? Just one other quick point. So because the town manager, um, the town manager can convene any committee to advise him. And as long as his decision, the decision rests solely with the town manager, those any committee or group that advises the town manager isn't subject to the open meeting law. So with that, uh, we're on to the next. Uh, okay. Thank you, Andy. So I'll go to Design Review Board. Uh, the appoint the uh, appointment subject to your um, approval is Karen Bloom of Twenty Seven Tanglewood Road. Wait, Ms. Bloom, uh, we, we, of we need to do one Sorry. thing. Oh. I, I'm, uh, I happen to be married to Karen, yeah. so I need to. Uh, uh, Athena, can you place me in the audience? So for the for the public and for the rest of the committee to know, uh, Paul is now about to make his recommendation. It happens to be uh, one of our uh, counselor's uh, spouse, and so. That's why uh, Bob was asked to be to step out of the meeting for this one discussion, which I did not know until just now. So, <laughs> um, so Ms. Bloom, is, <laughs> um, Ms. Bloom is um, has a, a keen sense of design as she has uh, communicated when we do we're doing the interviews. Um, she has a strong appreciation for the town's history and community values and um, level of public engagement. Uh, she's um, She doesn't have a direct design background, but she has um, a family history with some pretty impressive um, 
family members who are uh, architects and things like that. Um, but what she communicated to us mostly was about the need, her interest in looking at design from a person's point of view in terms of how public design uh, impacts residents who are walking down the street or um, and how it makes you feel. So she was a, a strong candidate. And um, so I made her appointment subject to your approval. Any comments or questions from fellow counselors? Councilor Ryan. Um, I wasn't aware of the connection, but that's it, not relevant really. When I look at this, Paul, the only thought I looked at the charge, we do get a fair amount of information, by the way, um, when Paul makes these um, these uh, uh, appointments or when he brings them to us. Um, and one of the key elements is the charge. And that probably will come up in a minute uh, later in another um, uh, issue. But um, the composition of this body is is spelled out in the charge. And as I know Paul knows well, it, it, it says that two of the members should be registered architects, landscape architects, or persons with equivalent professional training. And so um, that was going to be my question. It is my question, actually. And I guess, Paul, your answer is that this is someone who has personal, uh, familial uh, experience, but actually has no professional training. Is that is that a fair Correct. description of the candidate? Okay. Correct. But I think there are other people on the committee do, who have that experience. Uh, the person whose seat she is taking does not have is does not have professional training either. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, actually, I'm prepared to make a motion. Then, um, uh, was the Janet, or did you have a question? Sorry. No, I just um, the we. I just was responding to George. I agree that we do receive a lot of information as to the qualifications of the candidate being recommended, but what we don't know in the process is who else was an applicant. So, um, Governor George, Councilor Ryan, you wanna? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna move to recommend that the town council approve the town manager appointment of Karen Bloom for a term to expire on June 30, 2025 to the Design Review Board um, as filed with the town clerk on February 27, 2024. Second. Motion made and seconded. Let's see, uh, request for further discussion. Um, I will vote yes, uh, Councillor Ryan. Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. Okay, with that, I think uh, Athena can bring Bob back into the room, to the, into the meeting, and then Paul can make the next presentation as soon as he's back in. Okay. Paul, oh, back to you. Thank, you. Thank you. So the next appointment is the Elementary School Building Committee. I'm appointing Bruce Coldham of 159 Pine Street. Um, and um, so Mr. Coldham is an uh, 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 architect who has uh, attended pretty much every elementary school committee, building committee meeting since, since it began. Um, and he is a well-known architect uh, in town who is now retired. Um, and in my memo, I talk about the what the committee needs at this moment in time. And the, the in terms of the process, we had the chair of the school building committee, who is Councillor Shane, myself, and a member of the residence advisory committee um, conduct the interviews. Um, and one of the considerations we were looked at is was in terms of what is needed at this moment in time. And right now we are through the public engagement part that that has already been uh, completed. We are um, in the process of building. We're letting the the contract the uh, contract go. And there this is a complicated building. And Mr. Coldham is a um, has advanced knowledge about. 
uh, net zero buildings, uh, being one of the leaders in the nation on this knowledge. Um, and so we really are focused on um, building materials um, and the and the climate um, 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 features that we're putting into this building, including geothermal. Um, so right now, our sense was that this this committee really needed the support of building and, and energy expertise, which is why I've appointed Bruce. So, um, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I've served with um, Bruce Colgan for a number of years on the local historic district commission. I have fully supported him for the planning board. I have nothing but respect and high regard um, for Mr. Coldham. But I did want to ask, do you, because it came up in public comment in terms of a parent, that perspective being on the committee, if you could respond to that, please. Yeah, so we have a number of educators and parents um, on the committee. Let me just see if I can pull up the membership right now. And um, there are certain, uh, let me just, I'm sorry, it takes me a second. So we have a, a parent on the committee, Angelica Bernal, who's, um, who is also, who's um, involved with it. We also have uh, school committee, Deb Leonard, um, and Jonathan Salvin is also a resident member who's also a parent of, of students in the district. And we have Councillor Walker, who's also a counselor, but also a parent of students in the district. So we have several parents who are already on the committee. I think the other thing that I would just uh, point out in support of what uh, town managers said uh, regarding somebody with net zero energy experience, uh, in my prior life on the select board, uh, I was uh, chair of the committee that developed the final net zero energy uh, bylaw, which was then adopted and uh, has been in place and is part of what we're doing. And um, Bruce was very helpful from his background professionally in advising us as members of the committee um, on several occasions, both con uh, contacts between the two of us, me as chair and, and Bruce as an outside expert and the committee as a whole, um, I, he is quite knowledgeable about the subject. So I just wanted to reinforce that. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to to echo that that sentiment. I think the one thing that concerns me about the new elementary school is that we're getting into areas where we don't have a lot of expertise. And uh, things can go very bad <laughs> very quickly if you don't know what you're doing. So I think uh, it's good to have that kind of experience uh, helping us uh, build, you know, through the construction phase of this of this building. Yeah. Uh, are there any other architects on? There are no architects uh, or so. background on the committee now. There is Jonathan Salvin from Coon Riddle. Yeah, that's right. Just wanted to get that out. Um, Jennifer? Um, yes, I, I said, you know, my <clears throat> concern is more with the process, but I hope that we can address that in another meeting. And also a concern that I think there are some residents who bring a lot of expertise that apply multiple times to serve on our multiple member bodies and don't have the opportunity to do so. So I would like to look at if the process can address that as well. Okay, um, but I think that we agreed we'd take that into a separate and direct topic. Council Ryan? Prepared to make a motion. I move to recommend the town council approve the town manager appointment 
of Bruce Coldham to the Elementary School Building Committee for a term to last the length of the MSBA process as filed with the town clerk on February 27, 2024. I'll second. Is motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? Let's vote on the motion and then I might have one quick follow up before we go on to the next committee. Um, but uh, Councilor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Bob Hegner? Aye. Jennifer Tab? Yes. And I'm a yes. So it's four to zero. Um, Thank you. I was wondering um, if there would be any objection to including in the report that we have unanimously recommended this appointment, the reasons why, and to recognize that during public comment, we had received the question as to whether there should be an additional parent um, of a current school age uh, student and that we did consider that and are passing that along to the council that that was an issue that had been raised in public comment. Mm -hmm. I will include that in the report. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, um, try and get a report done fairly quickly now after this meeting and send it to the committee for um, review. So, um, Paul, back to you. Thank you. So the last appointment uh, on your agenda is for the Jones Library Building Committee, and I'm appointed Alex Lefebvre of 52 North Pres Prospect Street um, for this committee. Alex um, was a member of the committee um, when she was a member of the Board of Library Trustees when she, her term ended. Her term as a member of the committee um, ended as well. Um, but she has extensive experience, has worked really hard on this project from the very beginning. She chairs, uh, she did chair the library and building, library and building and facility subcommittee and has served on the J joint capital planning committee. But most importantly, she did a, a lot of outreach and a lot of work on uh, net zero um, energy for the new library. Um, so I am appointing her uh, for this position. Is there any Okay, uh, Councilor Ryan, you have your did you have your hand up? You, you mean? Sorry, um, I'm prepared to make a motion. I think. Uh, I, is there anybody who has questions? I think we all okay. Go ahead then. If there's no questions, I move to recommend the town council approve the town manager appointment of Alex Lefebvre. Uh, for a term to expire at the conclusion, for a term to last for the length of the building process to the Jones Library Building Committee um, as filed with the town clerk on February 27, 2024. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, this motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, let's go to a vote. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Bob? Aye. And I'm an aye. So that's four to zero. And I think that we are done with that, uh, with appointments. Is there any anything else you have to report to us at this point, Paul? So we have a couple of agenda items that um, we should get to. And uh, one is, um, I think the next one, and Jennifer, you had started saying that you had something you wanted to raise about it. And that is uh, the request from GOL that if we have recommendations as a committee for changes in the committee charge that um, we, we let them know and uh, I think we actually could continue this to the next meeting, but I wanted to at least get it out on the table today. So I put it on the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. So um, do you want to start? Did you have? Oh, about in terms the of the committee charge? appointment. 
Is there any comments about I'm looking for comments about the committee charge, anything that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. No, no. I had a I did have a question on the committee charge. It mentioned that TSO works with the colleges and universities. I don't. And I wanted just to, I mean, I think that's great, but ha what has that ever happened and what that entails? Let me, I'm trying, let me pull up that. Yeah, I'm trying to look for uh, that section. It's really under, up. it's under the outreach uh, portion, outreach and community relations. It says yes, review sir. and make recommendations to the town council on issues and measures related, or, excuse me, regarding the relationship between the town and Amherst institutions of higher education. Thank you. I do not recall the TSO has that we've ever done anything directly related to that to that because um, I think the uh, community and campus community coalition has not necessarily been related to the work of this committee. In particular, and um, the uh, strategic partnership agreements are town manager responsibility. Um, I don't know if uh, Paul or Athena have any recollection different, but I don't recall any <laughs> discussion. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Well, I think the fact that we haven't doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't. Um, that's a whole, I think that's what we're going to talk about. And I don't think we're going to have enough time today to do it, but I think it's something that we need to talk about. I don't suggest that we look back to the past to determine what we should do in the present. I think the question is, what does the charge say? What, what are we called upon to do? Um, and if the committee is willing to explore something related to its charge, it seems it's perfectly free to go ahead and do so. Um, so, this is a fairly broad statement, um, issues and measures, um, and it doesn't limit it just to uh, the areas of CCC, which deals more with student behavior. Um, we already had an issue today, and it's a matter we were dealing with related to North Pleasant Street, where the question arose appropriately, um, is there a way in which the university could be involved financially? And the answer was it already is, is engaged in that. So it may very well turn out that, that there are places where these actions, this is occurring at a whole other level, and there's no role for us. But this statement seems to suggest that there could be, and that's a matter for this committee to decide. The five members need to talk about it and say, well, I think this is something we should put on our agenda and maybe invite someone to come and, and talk to us. Um, I think that's what it says. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not presenting anything particular today, but uh, it seems certainly something that we could consider in the future. Um, I think that also applies to a number of other things related to services in general. Um, it seems to me that this is a body that um, could invite people to come and, and talk about provision of town services and how successful or unsuccessful they feel they are. And it's not in the it's not the intention to tell Paul how to do his work. It certainly is not that intention at all. But it is, I think, first of all, an outreach function on, from our behalf to find out what people are thinking about the services and how well they think they're they're being served. Um, and that could be a valuable tool for Paul and for staff uh, members to, to hear these voices. Um, I guess you could argue they could go directly to Paul, um, but I think this is actually part of our job um, as a kind of uh, intermediary between the residents whom we serve and, and, and Paul. Um, so I think there's a role for us here, um, and I'd like us to be more active in this area um, if the council, excuse me, if the committee so so uh, agrees. Um, and one of them would be university relations, but I think there are other areas as well. I've mentioned already senior services as a place where I think this is a basic town service, and I don't see why this committee can't um, find out what people are thinking about how well the town is doing, not what we're doing, but how well we're doing and what we could do better and what we're doing well. Uh, yes, I don't know that we want to go into this discussion today, however, uh, because the item on the agenda is actually whether we have any recommendations for change to the uh, current charge. That was the GOL request 
that we're responding to. And uh, so uh, it, essentially we focused on one paragraph and say, we like it being there. So we're not asking for a change is basically what it's for the purpose of what's on the agenda. Uh, I think that's the message. Athena? Um, I would respectfully disagree because I don't think the current charge includes um, you know, an evaluation of town services. It The committee is tasked with advising the council on matters that broaden participation and ensure regular and transparent communication and outreach to residents, which which doesn't really speak to what George had mentioned, uh, Council Ryan had mentioned. Um, it also works with community participation officers to engage the community um, and advise and make recommendations to the council regarding participation in community events. So again, those are you know advisory roles to the council rather than asking the committee to um, evaluate town services which I think falls very directly within the town manager's function. Um, so I think that if the council wanted to change the charge to include an evaluation of town services as part of TSO's function, that would be a change. It's, Judy, you were focusing, thank you for bringing it back because I was focusing on the question of the very narrow piece about the inclusion of the university and not the other. Uh, Jennifer? I'm sorry. I'm... Oh, I am unmuted. Um, I, I'll let George respond to, um, you know, what Athena's just responded to him, but I'll just add, add that I would like to have the committee discuss how we work with the colleges and university. And then I'll let George pick up on the town evaluating how well we're delivering town services. Okay, we'll go back to George. Well, I'm just gonna read the first uh, sentence of our purpose. TSO shall advise, advise the town council on matters concerning the day-to-day -day provision of services by Amherst government and the relations between the town and the community. How can we do that if we don't actually talk to the town community, if we don't invite them to come? I'm not I'm not talking about evaluating town services. I'm just talking about us being in communication with um, through our public meetings with various elements of the community that are recipients of town services to just hear what their experience is like. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that we're then I'm not saying let's evaluate DPW or let's evaluate sen the senior center. Um, but I would like very much to have this count, this committee be a place where people feel they could come and just express to us or tell us how they feel services, how they feel the services are going. Um, and uh, for us to hear that. Um, otherwise, it, you know, so I, I think the statement is pretty clear. Um, and so I think part of the issue is how we interpret this charge. And um, that's what we're talking about a little bit today. Because if we don't understand what it says, we can't really propose a change. So I would feel that the way it states, the way it is right now, gives us the authority or power to do some of the things that I'm suggesting we do. Athena, I think, very much disagrees. Um, and uh, so this committee needs to, I think, not necessarily this moment, but soon, sort of say, well, this is what we think this says. Um, and if they agree with Athena, then we would have a discussion about how we'd have to change it. And we have to go back to the council and say, we want you to, to insert evaluating town services. I don't really see it in that light. Um, maybe I'm, I don't think I'm being coy here. I think it's really about outreach and it's about a place where people can come or we can reach out and to a particular segment of our community that receives town services and invite them to come and talk to us about their experience and we would listen. Um, and uh, I think that's a pretty basic and important function. And it's kind of what I had in mind when I helped uh, form this committee back in the old days. Um, so I guess I need to hear what my colleagues think. Um, do they think we need to go to the council and ask for per their permission to do what I think the charge pretty much tells us to do? Um, and if so, then we should have that discussion. Um, what do people think this charge says? Andy, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
I, I love that you refer to just a few years ago as the old days. <laughs> That's the Ryan. Um, and, it, you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think that the, the, the needle that the committee would need to thread is what advice would the committee give to the town council about the provision of services since the day-to-day -day operations of the town are within the executive function in the charter. So I think, you know, the, the committee would have to figure out what, how, how listening to community members about town services could then be advisory from the committee to the council about some change, because I think it would be not, not advisable to hear from community members without the expectation that the council is going to do something with that, with that um, input, um, you know, just listening to folks and then not having a plan for how those, that input could be used, I think is, it can be frustrating for residents to speak to a committee and then not have some action. So I think clarifying what, what advice the count, the committee would give to the council, um, would be a good first step before you start to hear from community members so that there's a, a clear pathway from what the community members are telling the committee to what actions the council might take with that advice. George? I guess I'm struggling to, to see how I can, this committee can advise the council without actually hearing from the people who receive the services. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying we need to hear from folks and it doesn't mean we're gonna do anything. And we'll be quite straightforward. I mean, you know, we just want to hear from various elements. I mean, how are, what's your experience of our services? And maybe the answer, I mean, maybe nobody will respond because they're super happy. They think it's great. I, I have uh, two questions then to follow up on. One is that the, the, the sentence we're talking about currently says, Review and make recommendations to the town's council on measures that may affect the provision. And what is a measure? Is it a, uh, you know, I, I assume that the sense of the word is if there is something that is being proposed in the nature of a bylaw or another action. Mm -hmm. But that is what um, we're, uh, if, if a bylaw or some other policy question comes up that affects the provision of town services, like um, waste hauler, you said as the example, but mm -hmm. that, that is a very specific measure. It, it is, you know, the word measure is kind of a funny choice of words, but it is what's there. But I think that that's what was intended. That's the way I interpret it. Um, evaluation of town services to what to the extent that it comes up is part of the evaluation of the town manager, because that's where we're evaluating the services that are offered. And if there was great dissatisfaction with some segment of town government, uh, I think that that's where uh, the council gets into seeking community input about how services are being provided and the uh, where the council has a role. Paul? First, I, I just want to note that I have to get off to go to another meeting, but I did want to mention if the goal is to evaluate town services, you know, through a community survey or a public meeting, I think you would want to approach this sort of um, more scientifically, like what what is the um, goal of the council in approaching this? And I think one of the ways there are multiple tools that are at our disposal. Um, that communities use all the time in terms of um, surveying people who are use, using services, uh, public comments, things like that. But I think you, if you, if the goal is to evaluate town services, which I think what, what Councilor Ryan referencing, um, I think there are effective ways to do that that represent the broader community um, that might include a public forum type format, but could also include other things for people who don't 
typically attend forums as well. And I think we had, we had talked a little bit about that when with, with the community participation officers, it's just that people got overwhelmed um, with other work that's on their plate. Okay, thank you. So you have to duck out. And I, I do. Think thank we you. have to include the meeting too for our own purposes. Um, Councilor Ryan, uh, I have a suggestion then as to where to go with this. Yeah, I think I think we want to bring it to conclusion. I understand the meeting is we've reached the the end of our time. Um, you know, there's there are a series of reports that are done that have been done over the years related to town services, and they basically sit on a shelf. Um, you know, I find myself reading them sometimes and thinking, you know, do people really know anything about these um, in terms of, you know, uh, senior services, recreation, um, et cetera, and so forth. In other words, basic things that speak to the services that the town provides. And I feel that that I'm often in ignorance. And yet I'm supposed to be, again, advising the town council on matters concerning the day-to-day -day provision of services. So I agree that under the charge, it just says speaks of measures. So if people share with me, and we'll come back to this, I know, Andy, but if they share with me a sense that that we have a slightly bigger role as a way, as a place for, for us to learn, first of all, about the services that the town provides and, and read some of the reports that are created with great expense and time, um, and then speak to and consult with or listen to various groups in town that um, are users of our services simply to get an understanding of what we're doing and how's, how what's their sense of what's their perception of it. Are they happy, unhappy, whatever. Um, I don't know if you want to call that evaluation, I guess you could. Um, I just am trying to get us to a point where we feel like we as a committee have a sense of what, how well the town's doing the job, not how it's doing it, but how well it's doing it. And I don't see how we can do that just through a survey. And I've seen some surveys and, you know, I do. So again, enough for me, but I hope we can come back to this at some point soon. I'm sorry to, to interrupt, Andy. Um, I, I also have a, a 12 o'clock meeting that I'm, that I'm late for. So I need to ask that you wrap this up in the next few minutes as well. I will. Um, so my, uh, my recollection, the theme is, is that uh, GOL is not looking for an. They gave us a date, and it's after the next meeting. I don't think there's a sense of urgency from GOL at the moment. I don't think GOL has heard from other committees yet, and um, the focus right now for the committee is to. Uh, they're they're trying very hard to get their applicant pool sufficient for finance committee non-voting finance committee members and charter review committee members so and then they'll be focused on um interviews and so on so i don't think there's a sense of urgency about this yeah. so, so, so yeah, you can take um, it up at the next meeting thank you that's helpful because i think that what george is actually pointing out is that the purpose of the committee as stated in the charge does not necessarily then flow into the next piece of the charge where it says the TSO committee shall. And it, um, that he does, uh, what, what I think that George is really getting at is that that particular piece that he's talked about on measure, uh, uh, from the purpose doesn't flow into the second section so um, any counselor, including Councilor Ryan, who has suggestions for changes to the charge that would clarify that and bring um, a little bit um, strength, more strength to a particular issue, not just this one, that either on community, on town services or outreach and community relations, to bring that suggestion to the next meeting. And we will that will allow us to conclude the discussion for today.
And uh, the only thing that's then left uh, is, uh, are people ready to approve the minutes of February 1st and February 15th? Jennifer? Yeah, I had one um, addition to the, that I didn't see in the minutes. So yes, should I make go ahead. Um, I'm pretty sure it was that meeting where I had asked uh, if the waste hauler RFI response report could be made, a, would be presented at the March 14th meeting, which is today. Um, I had requested it and I had actually expected it to be on the agenda today, but I wanted that to please be in the minutes. Um, was that um, on February 1 or February 15? I'd have to check. I'm not, is it in our February 1st? Have we done our February 1st minutes? They're in the packet. Oh, I didn't see the February 1st in the packet. It, there, it was a late edition, in but they're in the packet. Okay. And we should hold off. It should be in we one of them. Off right? in the minutes. Um, okay. The other thing I want I urge you to look at is something that was else's in the packet for today's meeting, and that is um, the uh, thing that it's a, it's a chart of all of the TSO uh, meetings that we have planned for the next several months, um, actually through April, right now, and. Um, I don't know if Athena can quickly put it on the screen, but it's there for you. Um, it, it's in the packet, and uh, it is on the 28th that we put in the uh, waste hauler RFI. And basically what uh, George and I did in meeting with Athena and Paul was to take all of the things that we needed to do and to try and divide them evenly among meetings so that we would uh, make sure that we were balancing the time requirements and the um, amount of uh, and who we were asking to be at the meetings so that we could uh, not be asking people to come to meetings every time, uh, thinking particularly of DPW since so we relate to them so frequently. So this is what we came up with. Um, and uh, if you have any comments about it, you don't have to, you can send just me as an individual, don't send it to the group because I don't want to have any deliberation on this outside of uh, an open meeting, but um, you can make comments. Jennifer. Yeah, so we were told today, I think the word that on the March 28th, there was going to be a report on waste hauler. No, not a report, yes. an update. But I wanted, I, can we get some clarity that the report on the RFI responses will come on that date? Yes, it is. Look at the fourth bullet under the 28th. Right. Because I, no, I'm just saying this. I heard the word update on that report. But I I want to clarify it will be the actual report. My understanding that is the report. Maybe that could be in the minutes for this meeting. <laughs> okay. So noted, but that is my understanding, George. So can I uh, make a motion then to approve the minutes as presented? for February 1st and for February. Let's 15th. hold that off because uh, Jennifer uh, wanted to look at the minutes again. Okay, all right. So um, we're, gonna, we're not ready, okay. We're gonna Je uh, Jennifer, if you have um, edits to the minutes, if you please send them to me before I the next do that. meeting. I don't and want then to I can now. Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and then I, um, I'll share that the our the advice from KP Law about adjourning meetings is to take a motion and vote. So it's very clear when the meeting has adjourned. So I would advise the committee to take up that practice. Okay, hey, I'm gonna start by making a motion to adjourn and see if there's a second. Second. <laughs> okay. Uh, Can we discuss this please? You wanna? <laughs>
George, you either discuss it or vote. I vote aye. <laughs> and I vote aye. Jennifer? Aye. And Bob? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Thank for you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.